Hi everyone, this is a conversation I had with Stuart Lyle, who's the Urban Operations Research Lead at the British Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, or DSTL. He designed a platoon concept they're calling Urban Phalanx, which is a rifle company group optimized for urban warfare. I'll be doing a full video on that concept. When it's up, I'll put it in the description and pinned comment of this video. But the meat of it is the current rifle section would be expanded from 8 to 10 soldiers, with the section commander outside of the fire teams, and the addition of a dedicated systems operator for drones and a battle management system. The platoon has three of those sections, with another systems operator for the platoon commander with a larger drone, and a Carl Gustav recoilless rifle team. The proof of concept company group has two of these phalanx platoons, plus a maneuver support group with javelins, 81mm mortars, and sensor decider effector teams. In the description, there will be some articles covering the whole concept being trialed by two Yorks at the moment. In this video, I ask Stuart some questions regarding the urban phalanx concept, and he talks about some pretty interesting details that I don't believe have been published, so I hope you enjoy. The British Army's one experimentation battalion implementing something would imply that they see the urban fight as pretty high up on their list of priorities. Uh, you know, testing out this urban specific structure versus, you know, any other type of uh, structure for any other type of terrain. What was the impetus for a platoon and company specifically focused on urban warfare? With general trends towards urban combat and urban sprawl and large, large combat, is urban so important that it's worth basing small units around it by default? Or are there enough carryover benefits to the other types of terrain that an urban-centric structure is preferable? Because I, I notice that there are a lot of features that rhyme with some of the platoon-level reforms that the U.S. Marines want to push through, uh -huh. um, like with the systems operators. But their strategic yep. con uh, context seems a lot different, so... I just want to get your take on that. So your 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 two part question. Firstly, is about the 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 prominence of urban specifically within the British Army's uh, force development pipeline and priorities. Um, that is that is certainly up there. I mean, we had um, Chief of the General Staff gave a speech at the Russi Land Warfare Conference last year, talking about how the British Army is going to be one that majors on urban. Um, and there's this is part of a, an ongoing trend that's been going for about about three to four years now where urban operations has risen in prominence in terms of um, the focus that it's been getting in training. Um, we're starting to see it happening with equipment as well. So there's more emphasis on uh, on, on urban equipment um, or urban specific equipment um, and, uh, and, and really sort of rewriting of things like doctrine uh, as well. So it kind of, the, the urban phalanx concept came about at a time when urban operations was was on the rise within that level of prioritization um so dstl uh, did this uh, as as um actually independently of the army um so the army hadn't necessarily asked for it but dstl through various ways that there there's a number of different ways that dstl gets to um conduct our research and one of it was through um, money that's independent of the army um and so i was the uh, i'm the urban ops guy for for dstl so we were uh, so i was asked can you come up with some can you come up with a research question um that's going to to meet some of the requirements that perhaps aren't necessarily um being raised by the army because necessarily the um, the people asking the questions might not necessarily know all of the potential pitfalls within within urban warfare um, so I, I was asked to design uh, a research question, and this was one of the ones that uh, that we uh, that we developed um, and took forward. Um, part of the reason this is going to the second part of your question: why why the small unit is so important, and really it's because when you when you get into an urban fight, the the nature of the terrain breaks up battles. You don't have the same capacity to do brigade level maneuvers or battle group level um, activities. And really the largest kind of maneuver element that you'll see really being resourced is kind of company group and blue. Um, so it tends to break battles down into a much more of a small unit fight. Um, you then also end up with some of the challenges that, that imposes on junior leaders in particular. So in, a, in an urban fight, you've got a requirement for junior junior leaders, whether that be section commanders or platoon commanders, to be sources of information for higher formations in a way that they're not necessarily required to be 
in a more spread out rural battle. So there's a so there's a much greater um, level of responsibility put on those junior leaders. It's a more complicated terrain they have to try and contend with. They're in much closer proximity to the enemy, so there's an increased threat to them specifically. Um, and they're, they're now also having to coordinate both the close fight and also then feed information back up again. So it was, re was recognised that there's a, there's a much larger cognitive load, um, cognitive burden placed on junior leaders at that lowest tactical level as well. Um, so that was part of what um, drove some of the, the concepts within, within Urban Phalanx. Um, another aspect that sort of drew, was one of the key drivers was limitations on joint fires. So the you know the lack of um, some of the some of the joint fires capabilities when you're in that close fight um, compared to in a rural uh, area where at longer ranges you can employ your mortars, you can employ airstrikes, artillery in a way that when you're in that close fight and you're in that sort of less than 50 meter engagement zone, some of those options aren't even available to you. Um, so really, it was to try and address the the limitations on joint fires in that close urban fight, as well as also support junior commanders who end up having an increased level of responsibility in an urban fight than they do in a rural one. So that's what that's what drove the concept uh, development in the first place. So the the British Army's priority on urban. Was that driven by any specific event or conflict, or was that kind of just general, you know, this is this is what we see for large-scale combat operations. We're going to fight in an urban environment, so we have to make that kind of the centerpiece of our research. Yeah, um, it's not been driven by any one specific. You obviously get spikes of interest whenever things happen. Um, so when we had, uh, we were supporting the Iraqis with the Battle of Mosul, we saw an increase in, um, an increase in interest in urban warfare. Uh, and we've seen the same again over the last uh, the last year or so. But really what, what's driven it is the, the, the army has been looking at the trends for, for uh, sorry, the British forces writ large have been, have been looking at the trend in warfare for a while now. And if you look at any of the futures documents that the British, British defence has produced over the last 10 to 15 years, um, each of them have highlighted um, repeatedly that the trends in urbanisation have driven, uh, are driving us towards a future where we are more likely to conduct urban operations. And that's across the spectrum of conflict. That's not just looking at high intensity. Um, it's looking across, you know, from, from peacekeeping and counterinsurgency and stabilisation um, through to high intensity. Um, so there's a recognition that the way that the, the world's changing um, is, is going to change the way that the military conducts operations. Um, and we've done some some research on that as well. So if you uh, if you type into Google um, DSTL future cities, uh, you'll come up with a report which looks specifically at those trends. Um, and that's been quite influential at, at driving some of the the research and the focus um, that the British Army has been doing over the last uh, the last few years. Um, so really, it's not one specific instance that has made the army sort of stand up and and take notice. It's been more of a gradual increase in understanding the problem. Um, and realizing that this is an area where you, if, you're, if your force structure is geared towards rural operations, classic sort of um, fighting on the East German plane uh, or the West German planes, um, that drives your force structure one way. Um, but then historically, we've had to then shift it um, to then focus whenever we go and do counterinsurgency or peace support operations, which tend to have more of an urban feel to them as well. Um, so we end up having to shift it into something else. Um, and that's a transition that's not an easy one to make. Um, so, But then there's also a recognition that if we're going to see more high intensity warfare also happening in urban settings, then there might be less of a requirement to do that full transition constantly. And actually, it might be um, feasible for us to be optimized for urban operations. Um, and it's, it's less of a... Uh, it's less challenging to transition to rural operations than it is to transition from rural to urban. Um, so that was partly what we were asked to look at is actually, is this more difficult? Um, is it feasible to have an urban optimized force package and then still be able to employ it effectively in a rural one? And we've been doing an awful lot of testing on that as well. So we've been taking um, uh, the urban phalanx is obviously the section of platoon level that, you, that you're aware of, but we've also developed urban optimized brigade structures as well. Um, uh, so this DSL, we've been we've been developing the, uh, urban optimized brigade structures, uh, and we've been testing them in rural environments against uh, a spectrum of, of threat actors as well. 
Um, so it's uh, so that was one thing that we were specifically asked to look at is being urban optimized. Is that a bad thing? Uh, or, or actually, is there something that we can actually use as a, a default standard? You actually mentioned something that I was going to talk about or ask about later, but might as well bring it up. You mentioned brigade structures optimized for the urban fight. Uh, how do you think things will change at the battle group and brigade level when it comes to integrating new technologies in urban operations. I believe that uh, Brigadier General Woolridge said that urban is a squad platoon company commander's fight and the brigade commander's job is really more about allocating resources and setting conditions. And that's part of the urban thing is it's essential. That's a, that's a squad leader and platoon leader war. Yes, we're talking about planning stuff over the brigade and the division level, but what you guys will be doing is you guys will be allocating resources, right, and setting conditions. You won't be fighting shit, right? Your, your company commanders, your platoon leaders are going to be fighting this, right? But now that you brought it up, I'd, I'd like to see your take on or within the context of the British Army experimentation. Yeah, so this was the, the work that we did specifically looking at an urban optimized brigade was very much looking beyond the current equipment plan. So our current equipment plan is going to take us to 2035. That's when we expect our, our current plan to deliver the, the full force of Challenger 3, Ajax, uh, Boxer. They're all going to be in service by 2035. Um, we were tasked to then look beyond that and and try and scoop out what would a what what could a conceptual brigade structure look like that might be ur urban optimized and it was all because the research that we that we did on the urban phalanx showed that um some of the some of the ways that we were optimizing it for urban um really made a significant difference uh whenever it came to to actually fighting in an urban fight we baselined it against our current structures um and the urban phalanx was significantly um better so it was around looking at that and going, okay, well, we've got some um, some pr some pretty convincing evidence that that there's a there's a need to change. Um, so let's then look then beyond that section of platoon level and say, you know, they don't operate in isolation. Let's let's look elsewhere. And really, what the brigade structure uh, was focused on was the company level. Um, so if you think about, you know, the current the current sort of apex of uh, uh, if you ask most of the um, most combat arms officers, the, the apex of their career is to be a battalion commander um, and to potentially run that, that battle group. Um, what we were trying to do was actually sort of shift that focus and make the uh, the company commanders um, be the, be the sort of the, the rock stars. Um, so the notion of having combined arms company groups were, was really the, the focus of it. And everything at brigade, uh, or sorry, at battle group and brigade level was about supporting and enabling those company groups. Um, so that really was the, the, the primary focus of it. Um, it was really important that they be um, combined arms company groups because what, what ends up happening on, uh, on operations is that people get deployed into an urban fight and then they get a whole load of attachments and, and, uh, and other arms bolted on to their company because that's what you need. You need engineers to help you clear, um, clear obstacles or breach into buildings. Um, and clear the route so you can get the logistics through. The logistics has to operate in a slightly different way because it's much shorter logistic chains, but you get different um, different demand signals coming. Um, when it comes to um, so your fires chain, you need your your forward observation officers, your JTACs, they need to be much further forward in that contact space simply because they can't see what's going on uh, without being much further forward. So it puts them at higher risk. Um, and then you need more direct fire components as well, because you can't rely on joint fires to the same extent as you could in a rural setting. So it's much more about sort of dismounted direct fire. Um, so really what, what we did was we designed um, a force structure based around the company group and everything else was kind of geared towards supporting that, that, that company group. Um, that's been fed into the the British Army, and uh, and they're looking at that uh, specifically with um, you've said, you've heard about the next generation uh, next generation combat team that is focused on that company level. So it's trying to to develop that that company group, that combined arms company group. Um, so it's really kind of taking DSTL's work and exploiting that and actually testing it in the real world. So the one thing that we tested in our modeling and simulation uh, systems, which are phenomenal the the level of detail they can do is, is exceptional um but what it cannot do 
uh, is the human element of that. So you've got a systems operator operating, you know, sort of hand in glove with the section commander or the platoon commander, helping feed them information. And we can model what that looks like in terms of increased uh, situational awareness and um, uh, and speed of decision making in the simulation. But what we can't do is then test how does that work uh, fit within, um, or so how does that concept actually work in reality? Can that person actually uh, operate the drone at the same time as updating the ATAC system and keeping the platoon commander um, abreast of what's going on? Um, so that's what the Army's been doing. So, um, so DSTL has been working with uh, the Experimentation and Trials Group to then translate what we did, uh, what, so our force design, um, and some of the results that we saw from our simulations and help them translate that into the physical world and actually take it out onto um, Salisbury Plain um, and into Coopal Down Village and actually test it in the real world so that we can get the feedback from them about you know what was the what was the physical burden like what was the cognitive burden like for those individuals did it actually help um, and uh, and actually sort of get that that complete picture so you've got the DSTL design you've got the DSTL simulation uh, and modeling output and then that's fed into the army and they're doing that live uh, the, the the live trialing of that. Um, obviously, there's limitations to the live side too. They can't go and fire Carl Gustav anti-structure rounds into Kupildown Village, um, but we could do that with the simulation uh, on modeling side. So it's really DSTL and the Army working hand in glove to kind of test it out properly. Um, and hope, hopefully, we're uh, uh, we're going to get some really good results. We're still waiting to hear the the full results from uh, Wessex Storm because that's when he just completed. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll hopefully hear that that soon enough. Um, but all the reports so far, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen the British Army video um, that they pushed out, um, saying that um, they were very happy with it. So yeah, we've got the two sides working together really to kind of exploit it. Sure. Um, so just a little more con context on the urban phalanx platoon itself, in terms of the intent of the design as written, so the two phalanx platoons, uh, 10 man sections. D do you think the platoon design as published should go through, well, if the if the testing is favorable, and end up as a general purpose design across the infantry? Or is it more of a demonstrator for things within research question constraints for testing things like the systems operator while also having um, no substantial growth so it's feasible to do with an uh, existing unit for the testing purposes? That's an interesting question, and I would say that from a from a personal perspective, I I would like to see it get taken forward, taken forward, and actually become the standard. I think actually what we what we were able to demonstrate was that um, both from our simulation and hopefully with um, with what the experimentation trials group are, are testing as well, we can show that it's not. Uh, urban specific that sometimes puts some people off they think oh well we need to actually be be good for for all things and that's true um we need you know people rightly bring up things like what about mountain arctic what about um jungle um uh, that's absolutely it's absolutely true uh, our argument would be that um urban is the most complex of the complex terrains and the one that is fairly universal you can go to a hot sandy place and you'll still go into an urban area. You can go to a jungle place and you'll probably still come across some urban settlements. Um, and so it's it's the universal complex terrain. And actually, if you can work effectively in that, then that has transitional benefit for for the other ones. Um, so that's so that's while urban optimized sometimes puts people off. Uh, we don't see it quite like that. Um, and thankfully, neither does the next um, neither does the experimentation and trials group, which is why they're they're running with it. So the intent with ETG is to test it and see whether it is fit for purpose to then roll out across the army. Um, there's obviously going to be things for the army to try and iron out, whether that be um, manpower levels, whether it be training. Um, if you, you know, if you've got combined arms company groups. Um, how do the engineers get training without being in a, in a, within an engineer battalion? If they're not attached to an engineer battalion, how do you do career management? That sort of thing. Those are, from an institutional perspective, for our, our, our challenges to it. Um, and the, there's other parts of DSTL where we can work with the work with the army and actually help them figure out those challenges and how to overcome them. Um, but I'd like to, I personally, I would like to see it to see it roll out because one of the challenges that we've seen with the adoption of new technology and uh, defense science and technology laboratory, we help the army an awful lot. We're trying to experiment with new pieces of kit. 
Um, and one of the things that we see time and again is that we push new technology into the sections or into the platoons, but we, there's no resourcing of personnel to then exploit it. So there's an assumption that if you put a drone, whether it be something like Black Hornet um, or something else, you put that into the infantry section, there's an assumption that somebody's then got spare capacity to be able to fly that drone. And that's not necessarily the case. So you give somebody the, the option between uh, covering a threat arc um, or flying a drone, they're more likely to um, you know, man a weapon system and, and cover cover an arc um, because that's where the greatest threat in, in their mind's eye is rather than necessarily being able to see what's over the, over the horizon. Um, so really what we're seeing, and it's the same rationale with the U.S. Marine Corps with our systems operator. In fact, I went over to the um, U.S. Marine Corps' warfighting lab when I was developing the, the urban phalanx concept and actually worked with the team that experimented with our systems operator to try and figure out, you know, is this something that we could translate over to the UK and what were the um, what were the challenges that they find? Um, so, so yeah, you're, you're right to highlight that earlier on because that is something that we uh, that we borrowed from them. Um, but really, it's, it's one of these things where if, if the British Army is wanting to leverage the technologies that we've been trialing um, and we're currently running, we're currently helping the army to trial more um, urban equipment at the moment. We've got the Army Warfighting Experiment, which is going to be focusing on urban for the next three years. And we're helping them to do that. But if we don't resource people to actually run that technology, um, ultimately, it'll, it'll arrive and, and not necessarily get uh, and, and there's a chance it might not get used. Uh, which is what we saw with things like Black Hornet previously. While they're very good having all these bits and pieces, if you haven't got them resourced with people to actually run them, there's a limitation to what they can actually bring to the fight. So you brought up the potential institutional problem when, like, for example, engineers are attached or organic to an infantry unit, and then, you know, there might be skill loss. They don't have as much access to expertise. Did you encounter any big challenges with sustainment and and maintaining proficiency with weapon systems if they're shifted from the battalion level from the support company to the rifle company level? I, I couldn't speak to that at mm -hmm. the moment because that's not something that we would have found in our simulation and modeling. That would have been something that um, that ETG might find with the with, with experiment with the next generation combat team. Um, I'll say that when you look at what the next generation combat team has been has been experimenting with, there's the maneuver support group um, as part of that. So the company is two two phalanx platoons and a maneuver support group, and that maneuver support group is you is entirely um, comprised of what would be battalion level assets. So whether it be machine guns in the sustained fire roll, javelins or mortars, they are not coming from outside the battalion. So if Effectively, it is just um, a uh, a more permanent uh, um, allocation of those assets to the company, rather than necessarily having them um, just temporarily assigned. Um, so I don't see that as being a I don't see those as being a challenge in the current setup. Um, if we were to then envisage looking at the concept that we looked at for the brigade level, the 2040 concept, um, then that would be much more challenging um, than than what the current next generation combat team is because that would have actual engineers uh, as opposed to um, sort of assault, uh, assault pioneers or, or organic to the battalion. Um, it would have, um, there was there was armor platforms in there as well. Um, so effectively a tank, so in a vertical almost tank platoon um, or tank troop attached to the company as well uh, as, a, as a maneuver support group or uh, as a fire support group. Um, because we were looking at it in the 2040 time frame, we were able to then look at around, could these things be robotic autonomous systems? And what are some of the implications of that? Um, which means that you might have less of a requirement for people from, say, the Royal Armoured Corps to then staff those things. Is that something that, that might that might ease some of those, um, uh, those challenges? The capability might be able to be generated from within the infantry battalion. Um, but it's... Um, it's very much in the conceptual stage at the moment. We're in the exploratory level um, and the bit that we're not trying to solve at the moment is the the institutional and through life career management and training side. Um, this is very much we want to we want to be able to demonstrate the, um, the utility of the concept in terms of an operational context. And if we can do that, 
then we can figure out where you know what is this what is the squeeze in order to get that juice um so if we know that the juice is good we can then figure out whether or not um yeah we need to go we need to go after the squeeze yeah i th- i think that there's um often a public misconception when it when it, there's experimentation like this the the gut feeling is it hasn't all been thought through, but it's also it's also a process, and it's going to be refined. So I think I think that's a that's a good point to bring up about the the company structure. Uh, do you think there's trade offs between having the two larger phalanx platoons versus three of the normal rifle platoons? Um, do you think if, if possible, having three phalanx platoons would be preferable or do you think that having the, the, the smaller amount of maneuver elements is preferable? So what I will say is that the, the next generation combat team structure, which is the two platoons and the maneuver support group is a proof of concept, um, effort. It's not saying that that is what we should have um there's nothing to say that um that we wouldn't that we couldn't have three platoons and a maneuver support group almost like the u.s army ranger structure um so there's no so it's not to say that that the two two platoons and a maneuver element are are, are, and a support element is is the way that's not we're not saying that's the answer so when when dsl designed the brigade structure we based it on three phalanx platoons and a far support um element um that was what was in uh the what we call blockbuster concept um so that was so that was that's what we that's what we looked at was the, the three platoons another thing to note is that atg is based around the experimentation battalion is two yorks um and two yorks only has uh it, it is an experimentation battalion so it only has so much manpower so that they have to work within those limitations whenever they want to try and be able to push um, specific company groups or whatever uh, out into the field. So um, there are limitations as to what they can experiment with at the moment, but there is options to then expand it later on. So if you look at the video that the British Army put out and you've got Colonel Toby Till, who's the commanding officer of the Experimentation Trials Group, he's very clear about saying that what they've been trialing might not might not be what the answer is, might not be what, what becomes the next generation combat team. And they are looking at multiple iterations of it. And this is only the first one but what they are um, seem to be fairly consistent with is that the phalanx platoon is the good foundation for that um, because it brings together all those extra bits of having somebody who's actually able to help reduce that cognitive burden for the platoon commander or the section commander. It allows somebody to actually be able to control some of them for um, the 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 I-Star drones um, uh, and that sort of thing. You've got more lethality pushed down to that lowest tactical level as well. So they're very adamant that that seems to be the uh, the foundation of whatever the next generation combat team ends up looking like. But at the moment, um, it's based on two platoons and a maneuver support group. But that's not to say that that's going to be what it is in the future. One question about the maneuver support group. Um, mm-hmm. For my audience, actually, uh, where where do you think assault pioneers will fit in? Because I've read that uh, two Yorks combined their battalion machine gun platoon and pioneer platoon into one maneuver support group, uh, basically to allow the machine gun team or the machine gun platoon to better prepare positions and cross obstacles. And I've also heard that some battalions are rolling the pioneers into an ISR company, like in the Paras. So in the spirit of Phalanx, do you foresee them staying as a battalion asset or getting shifted down to the company as an organic company element? That uh, is an excellent question. In terms of the, um, when we were looking at how this would then expand upwards uh, with a blockbuster concept, we had Assault Pioneers as company level assets and that was that was seen as a necessary requirement for being able to support the maneuver battle and be able to rapidly create breaches in uh, in buildings or to clear obstacles and then also you know shore up defenses and having them as company assets kept them uh kept them resourced because it was the company uh the company needed them so therefore it was the the company was better able to actually um exploit what they have um in terms of the British Army at the moment, assault pioneers are one of these oddities where not every battalion has them. They are an under-resourced but um, overused 
capability. So whenever you see any of the post-exercise reports about uh, people doing urban operations or urban exercises, you know they 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 expend their assault pioneers pretty quickly, uh, and that's if they have them. Not all battalions do have them um, because of manpower constraints or the specialist training required for them. Um, so we would we would say. For our, from a, looking at it from a conceptual force design perspective, um, assault pioneers are essential. We would like all battalions to have them. Um, and as we envisaged an urban optimized force, they were organic to the company groups. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what is necessarily going to happen. So it might have been, as I mentioned before, because ETG are um, have the constraint of having the two York's experimentation battalion. Um, so it might have been where they uh, they ha- they were forced to do that because that was what they had in terms of their manpower availability, uh, and really for testing and experimentation that might have been fine, um, but that's not necessarily to say that that is the answer. Sure, that that clears it up a bit. Um, what what assets that are currently in support companies do you think would remain under the battalion commander's control, if any? Because um, you t- talked about uh, anti-tank assets going to the companies, um, loitering munitions potentially, mortars, and and assault pioneers with uh, in in the ideal case. So I think all that's left is the recce platoon, right? Yes, to some extent. So whenever we uh, when when we were looking at the blockbuster concept, we looked at um, holistically across the boards. So we we probably put in more lethality than what you would expect in that company group, um, because what we were looking to do was to be able to resource as much of the close fight as possible um, within within that company's own organic systems. Um, so we yeah we had an awful lot of lethality pushed down there, and less so at the higher formations. Um, but in terms of the battalion level, yes, we, they had uh, battalion was was recce. Um, uh, but I think um, at battalion level, we also gave them 120 millimeter mortars as well. Um, so they were able to effectively um, resource uh, an indirect the indirect fire fight beyond what the companies could. Um, now, ETG with the next generation combat team, they've been using 81 millimeter mortars because that's what two Yorks has. Um, and they've been assigning them to the company groups. Um, but again, it's, it's not saying that, um, that that's, that that's necessarily the answer. Um, and like I say, the, the next generation combat team is a first look at putting this into, into the real world and seeing, you know, sort of what works and what doesn't. Um, it's not saying that this is, this is the way um it's uh it's very much kind of like this is an iterative process um they've already brought out um alternative concept diagrams that they're looking at doing over the next year and a half um and moving into um mounted forces as well so there's the the next generation combat team that you've seen is is just one iteration that they are trialing um the only thing that is kind of sort of set um set in stone as much as can be um, is that the foundation is going to be the phalanx platoon? Are they, are they looking at adopting a hundred twenty millimeter mortar? Or is that kind of uh, theoretical? Maybe based on what you, the U.S. has done. So for the urban optimized brigade, uh, we include it as a recommendation simply because the the one twenty millimeter mortars have proved very effective in previous urban battles so if you look at second battle of fallujah that was um that was one of the principal indirect fire assets that was that was used um by the close combat elements uh simply because the 120 has that bigger bang and punch to be able to get into a building and deliver the effect it needs um over 81 or 60 um so that's what we looked at but that doesn't necessarily mean that that has to be set in stone there's um there's work going on at the moment to look at um what's being you know what mortar variant is being bought for the boxer vehicle that sort of thing so um that's not to say that um we have to have 80 um have to have 120 and not 81 it's uh, it's it's a broader question than that um but we put in 120s because that complemented some of the capabilities that we put into the concept at company group level um not necessarily because we said that 120 mortars is the answer. 
Do you recall how many uh, 120s was recommended at the battalion level, or is it kind of just a more general recommendation? Uh, it was more of a general recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, what it would, what it might end up looking like, uh, was very different. We had, um, we had them based on robotic autonomous platforms, um, and basically, um, part of that was about trying to reduce man, um, uh, the personnel bill within the battalions. Um, at the moment, one of the largest personnel draws um, within a battalion is the mortars because you have an irreducible minimum of people to then operate a mortar system Um, and without that without that irreducible minimum you don't have that mortar capability Um, whereas you can run a section with seven or six people um, in, in you know it's it's feasible to still have a maneuver element with six people but you can't run a mortar with less than that irreducible minimum so they tend to get resourced pretty early on um and what we were trying to look at for the conceptual force in 2040 time frame um one of the challenges that we're trying to help the army with is how do we do more with less in terms of people um so if we can automate mortar systems which you know is perfectly feasible even today we automated mortar systems um if we could exploit some of that technology by the 2040 time frame and actually have the, the platform be robotic robotic autonomous um and then there's a way for us to be able to generate that cap- that same capability without relying on the same numbers of personnel so you would so you would simply have rather than having a full mortar platoon fully um uh fully equipped with personnel uh, and equipment what you would have is the same level of effect being delivered but with a fraction of the personnel uh, operating simply as a maintaining section rather than necessarily operating the mortars themselves so you mentioned the automated systems um, and I've seen that uh, two Yorks, I think their machine gun platoon, is trialing the, the unmanned ground vehicles with, uh, I, I forget what the weapon was, but it was direct fire, maybe it was a machine gun. Um, what other roles do you think unmanned ground vehicles are going to play in terms of British urban doctrine? That's, uh, that's a very broad question. It's one that we spend an awful lot of time working on here. Um, obviously, with uh, being the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, we spend an awful lot of time um, trying to figure out the future of un, uh, uncrewed ground vehicles um, and where they fit on the battle space. Um, there's, there's an awful lot of questions about how they're used and what they're going to be used for. Um, the British Army's had a program that we've been helping them with for quite some time now, looking at the robotic platoon vehicle um, and whether that be simply a remotely operated mule to help carry load or whether we put some sort of weapon system on it um there's been an awful lot of uh, experimentation with that so what it ultimately ends up looking like uh, i wish i had the crystal ball that could tell me that um but uh unfortunately that's 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 well outside um uh, my my abilities of prediction um what i do know is that we've been helping them um to, for trying to figure out the tactical utility and some of the pro, pros and cons of that and we do an awful lot of red teaming sessions where we will develop concepts and then put them into tactical vignettes to try and see, okay, well, if we can put this into into the battle space, um, does it reduce casualties? Does it deliver greater operational output um, for for that 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 platoon? Um, does it uh, does it reduce cognitive load? Um, one of the things that we we've been quite adamant with the army is saying that if you're going to put a kinetic effector on that weapon system, it has to be something that cannot currently be delivered by a individual because um, otherwise you're you're overcomplicating the delivery of the same effect. Um, and uh, and and we also look at things like risk as well. The, if these things are if these uncrewed ground vehicles are expensive, um, then yes, you can take more risk with them, but also you are still going to be hesitant to take that risk because these are expensive platforms and you're not going to get uh, a ready replacement for them if they are expensive so trying to get trying to get the army to think through some of the the pros cons um and break down some of those myths people just automatically assume that because it's an uncrewed system you can take more risk uh, and in reality that's not necessarily the case um so trying to get uh we we've been working with the army quite a lot um for quite a number of years now um to try to try and look at that um and look at all those things so i i've been involved in um so the army calls it the agile warrior program uh, and that's been the Army's research program looking at the future of land warfare. Uh, and I've been involved in every iteration of that for the last 10 years, um, since the very first one. Um, and uncrewed ground vehicles has been a, a perennial um, feature of those. So we've got reams and reams of reports looking at 
a, a wide spectrum of uncrewed ground vehicles, where they can fit in the battle space, what are the pros and cons of their use, how might an adversary react to the uncrewed ground vehicle if it comes uh, wasn't around the corner, um, what's the enemy going to do? Um, and um, and yeah, like I say, it's that that's a very broad question you asked there about what's what's the future of uncrewed ground vehicles? It's it's huge. So I'm going back to the phalanx concept more concretely. The articles I read on the British Army website and or the MOD website and the Soldier Magazine article, uh, they mention a combat service support group, uh, but doesn't really go super in detail with that. So do you think you could elaborate on what that is? Is it just an expanded echelon in the company HQ or is it something a little bit bigger than that? So that's being used as an umbrella for testing some of the 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 wider concepts of how we would support the next generation combat team. So there is a rec- there is a recognition that it's not all about the the kinetic side, and it's about how do we do things like casualty evacuation, um, how do we do resupply under contact in complex terrain. So there's been an awful lot of work that's been going on to look at types of things that we could bring in. At the moment, it's the quad bike with a stretcher on the back uh, on and um there's a recognition that yeah you know, there's there's other technology that might be able to help with make that and uh, make that same effect more um uh, more effective so so that's what they've been looking at so you've seen things like in the vi- um you've seen the videos of the kazavak uh, uncrewed air systems um, and looking at how we can winch casualties out of, say, you know, a narrow urban canyon or off the roof of a tall building. Um, how can we actually get that casualty out of there? Um, so that's that's what they've been looking at. Um, they've also been looking at heavy lift drones for last mile resupply um, and other things. And that is but one line of effort. So DSL is also helping the Army with the Army Warfunding Experiment, which has been looking at that. And the last event that they ran, which was last uh, October, November, that was looking specifically at um, uh, sustain and protect. So looking at how do we sustain forces and how do we do force protection better as well. So uh, so that's been that's been a uh, an ongoing effort. So whenever you've when I, if you see any references to in say the Soldier Magazine was talking about the CSS group, that's more of an umbrella um, of uh, covering lots of different experimentation, looking at just generic CSS type effects and how we might do them differently. So in one of the articles, uh, you talked about how the force's ability to use, to employ fires is reduced, less mortars and artillery. I, I've seen your other talks and you talk about how, you know, the verticality of the urban environment makes it so, you know, you need high angle artillery. You might not want to overly rubbleize the environment because that impedes maneuver. Do you think you could just elaborate on that? Because I think when people hear their thoughts kind of jump to, oh, artillery isn't useful in the urban environment. I just, mm. I, just I think it's worth uh, assuaging those concerns. Yeah, it's it's not saying that joint fires doesn't have a place. In fact, joint fires is is phenomenally useful, but it's um, there are it's naive to ignore the limitations in that clo- in supporting that close fight. Um, the average engagement range for dismounted troops in urban combat is less than 50 meters. Now that doesn't mean that you're not going to be having the opportunities for doing longer shots. Um, but that is the average because you, you know, the majority of fighting is between buildings or, you know, across the street um, or a- across a courtyard. Um, so what that means is that if you're trying, if you're relying on joint fires to make up for any deficiencies in your direct fire capabilities in the weapon systems you've got organic to your uh, platoon, um, then you are relying on a system which may not necessarily be able to deliver the effect that you need it to in the way that you need it to. So minimum engagement ranges, uh, danger close zones, um, they all tend to be measured in hundreds of meters. Um, let, you know, not not 50 meters and less. Um, so there's a there's a challenge with even just the the effect that that munition is going to have in that in, in that closer proximity. Um, in terms of gun target lines as well, um, tall buildings, artillery fires on a ballistic trajectory. If there is if there is a, an impediment along that gun target line, then you may have to move the guns. So it doesn't mean that you couldn't do it. You might bring the guns closer and then fire on a higher angle and have it come down. Uh, or you might move the guns laterally and then be able to have uh, le- um, an unimpeded gun target line. 
um, but that then imposes a delay. And obviously the troops in contact have, uh, have asked for fire support because they are they're deemed unable to uh, resolve that situation using their organic systems. So it's about recognising the fact that there are limitations to what can be applied with joint fires. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not ignoring the fact that they have a massive role to play. The majority of, of casualties, even in an urban fight, are still um, delivered through artillery and, air, and airstrikes. Um, not necessarily the close fight, although we do see a, a slight rebalancing of that compared to rural fighting. So yeah, so it's not it's not trying to to reduce, uh, or it's not trying to say that they don't have a role to play, but it's trying to um, cover off uh, all the instances where they might not necessarily be able to deliver the effect. Another aspect, as you mentioned, about uh, I've I've said about rubbleizing the terrain, collateral damage is obviously a critical component of urban operations, and we like to fight within the law of armed conflict and keep. Um, uh, a, a key tenet of that is proportionality. And if we can deliver the necessary effect using an organic system, direct fire system at the platoon level, then that reduces our reliance on joint fires, which will result in larger levels of collateral damage. It will rubbleize the terrain, which will impede maneuver follow on forces. Um, you'll have to have engineers come forward and clear the rubble off the street so the log- logistics can get through and support the next level of maneuver. So if we can resource thing, if we can resource the close fight using those much more discreet, precisely delivered effects, um, using things like an anti-structure round from a cargo staff, um, or um, using airburst 40 millimeter grenades, then then that's a way for us to be able to resource that close fight without relying on a, all those joint fires assets. So the less we have to fire artillery into an urban space, then the better. And that's, you know, it's better, you know, reduces civilian casualties, reduces blue force casualties uh, for any um, uh, any concerns about collateral damage and blue on blue. And ultimately, it reduces the the actual the physical damage to the city and the infrastructure. So it's it's a good thing if we can reduce the reliance on joint fires. But it doesn't say that they don't have a, a role to play. You talk about using the direct fires. Did your office uh, make any significant recommendations with regard to the integration of tanks into the company groups or um, maybe the battle group level, or is that kind of uh, outside of the scope? Yeah, in the in the blockbuster concept, the uh, the urban optimized brigade, we had a a tank troop like capability within each of the company groups. So we had three robotic autonomous systems armed with, uh, well, we, we based it on a 105 cannons, but they were, yeah, like I said, robotic autonomous systems. So they were smaller. Um, we could do clever things with the armor, with, a, with, an, uh, with an uncrewed system. You can focus the armor on the critical bits rather than necessarily the, the, so the, the entire chassis, um, which means you can get away with greater protection on a smaller vehicle uh, and keep the weight down. Um, but but yeah, ultimately we we did give them a a um, a tank troop like effect uh, effector at, um, at at the company level. Um, done, and there was a there was a conscious decision to go for 105 rather than 120 as well. Um, some of the limitations on um, blast effect around the muzzle, um, the structural damage that a 105 hesh round would give rather than a 120. Um, those sorts of things did, came into play with some of that discussion. Um, and then another thing we gave them was a robotic autonomous system that was known as the the assault breacher vehicle. So taking the old uh, Centurion Avery type capability and pushing that down into a company group level uh, with a much smaller robotic autonomous platform, because it's you know that that type of system in that urban fight is a very discrete system that will be brought forward, do its job, and then you know be pulled back. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, a fully crewed system that will be able to go for 200 kilometers keeping up with the contact battle because this was based around that urban optimized force which is going to be doing much smaller um maneuver binds so there wasn't really a requirement for the big the big asset but we still gave them that one six uh, i think we based it on a on a 155 demolition gun um so we had commonality of ammunition with the artillery at higher formation so with the with the phalanx sections um 10 men Two fire teams, four men each, section commander and systems operator. 
in your design, because this I don't think this was touched on in in the articles I read, are the fire teams themselves changing substantially from what they are now? Uh, I think it's too well, other than the section commander leaving the fire teams and getting a dedicated team commander. So I think they now have two uh, under barrel grenade launchers, uh, the sharpshooter rifle and the GPMG. Um, so I just wanted to see if there were any changes in your recommendations to that. No, there aren't. In fact, actually, I can um, I was uh, I can share my screen. I can show you. So this is this is what we had um, at the section level. You have two consolidated fire teams. Each has their own fire team leader. One of them will be the section two IC. Um, and and ultimately, it was about trying to. It was about trying to to remove the commander from one of the fire teams. That was that was a really critical com um, component of the concept because, as they have more responsibility to feed information up the chain of command, uh, we wanted to try and remove them from the minutiae of having to then do some of the clearance um, tasks. So at the moment, they will form one of the two-person clearance teams as they go into clear rooms. Um, which means that they immediately lose all of their situational awareness and, and their situational awareness reduces down to what is in that the room that they're in. Um, and really, we wanted them to perform more like a platoon commander and be able to step back from that, the, the minutiae of the job uh, and be able to focus on fighting the two individual fire teams, not being a part of one of those fire teams. Um, also, with with the urban battle, if you've got... if for whatever reason, that section commander needs to step away for um, uh, to do any any number of roles that they might have to fulfil. That fire team loses 25% of its firepower immediately. So it was trying to look at a way that you know how do we consult or how do we protect the firepower and the manoeuvre capability within the battalion uh, within the section, while also increasing the section commander's ability to actually be able to function in terms of coordinating their fire teams, but also then be able to feed information back up to the platoon commander or, or higher. Uh, and really that boiled down to having them being independent of the two fire teams. Um, what we wanted to try and do with the two fire teams was make them as symmetrical as possible. Um, so so that you know, they, they were they, each one of them was able to deliver almost identical effects. So one of them had a light roll machine gun. Um, now, at the moment, that's based on the GPMG, but we do know that um, the Infantry Trials and Development Unit is looking at what is going to replace the GPMG, and there's a, there's a number of options that they're looking at. Um, and so, you know, it'll be a effectively it was a light machine gun. So we just said, look, you've got you've got a light machine gun in one of the fire teams, and then you have a sharpshooter in the other fire team, and that means that you've got the capacity for suppression through volume or suppression through precision, uh, depending on which fire team you've got. So it gives that section commander options. Um, you've got a grenade launcher in each uh, in each section, um, and then you've got riflemen. Um, so so that was about keeping them as symmetrical as possible. Uh, and then you got the section commander and the systems operator operating sort of as that independent command element, um, and and effectively the 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 concept was about creating that J three five function, um, so focusing on the close fight, focusing on the next fight, um, and that was really what we wanted to try and replicate even at even down at section level. So you've got the section commander fighting the fire teams, and you've got the systems operator helping them think about what's coming next. Um, so that's really what what that boiled down to. Um, at platoon level, you've got three sections doing their thing, and then you've got platoon systems operator operating alongside the platoon commander. Um, there's questions about the radio operator. Do we still need that? Could the systems operator fulfill that role? Um, but that that's that's something that's going to come out through the the, um, the live experimentation. Less so what uh, what we would have done uh, in DSL with our simulation modeling. Um, and then there's the shoulder launch rocket team. So that's the Carl Gustav pair. So um, that was removing those shoulder launch effectors from the section, the larger shoulder launch effectors from the section, um, and then creating that as an independent um, element within the platoon. Now, with the platoon, w with the, the added power generation requirements, I believe the articles talked about like, all these batteries for all this new equipment. Do you think that the platoon will need its own uh, service support elements 
does does that play into it? Because I also read that the article or the article also said that the whole company was mounted on light vehicles for out of combat transportation. I don't want to get too into the weeds of the, the technical aspects of batteries and the like, because that's more about um, sort of consolidating the the power requirements within within the platoon. And actually, there's there's an awful lot of work um, that we're doing to help the army think more about this because that's that's a recognised problem beyond just um, the the next generation combat team. Um, in terms of the mounted element, the yes, they were mounted because there's been an acknowledgement that our light rail infantry don't necessarily have um, the mobility that they need, so they put they put them in um, pickup trucks. Now that was that was used as a as a surrogate for whatever an, an alternative platform might be. So that's not to say that the you know the British Army is going to be uh, light rail infantry is going to be mounted in Hiluxes from now on. Um, that was just to uh, effectively do a proof of concept that if you have them mounted in vehicles, you can increase some of their survivability or some of the effects they can deliver because you can you can outpace the enemy. So that's not to say that it's it's going to be one or the other. Um, in terms of the power requirements, yes, there there are issues because we're now putting in ATAC. Um, so we've got the DSA, the Dismounted Situational Awareness System with ATAC. Um, you've got night vision goggles, you've got drones, and uh, you've got a plethora of other things going in there. But as I mentioned, there's a there's a wider there's a wider issue across defence. Um, looking at this, uh, not this isn't specific to to the the phalanx concept. Um, you know, we're we are looking at DSA, um, uh, rolling that out regardless of the the structure it goes into. Um, similarly, we've got Black Hornet, and uh, we have for a while now, um, and issues with um, sort of battery replacement and and um, extended flight times has been uh, something that's been flagged right from the beginning. So yeah, it it it's a known problem, and there are people uh, working on that specifically. I think that does it for all the questions I had prepared. Do do you have anything you'd like to add on the structure? Maybe something I didn't ask. Um, so one of the integral pieces of the the concept was looking not just at the structure, but then also looking at uh, lethality. Um, so one of the things that we specifically looked at was the different weapon systems that could have been put in. Uh, we looked holistically at the types of weapon systems that you might want if you were going to be urban optimized. So we looked at, as you can see here, you got the, the GPMG versus a dedicated light roll machine gun. Um, and what differences might that make um, in terms of your uh, belt-fed systems or uh, your belt-fed um, weapon system being able to keep up with the rest of the section be able to integrate as part of the maneuver element in complex terrain not just inside buildings but even just out in the street being able to fire the gpmg from anything other than prone is you know it's a challenge um, so it was trying to sort of uh, generate the evidence to show that if we want to have a belt-fed capability it needs to be based on a system that is capable of being able to keep up with the uh, with the rifleman uh, and also be able to operate effectively within close terrain. Then the cargo staff was generated from the notion that, well, if you've got these heavy one-shot systems, um, that reduces your ability to maneuver through buildings with it, and it also reduces your, um, uh, your likelihood of being able to sustain that level of effort uh, or that level of effect. Um, you're having to resupply the tube and the munition each time as opposed to just the munitions. Um, and by having something that was reloadable, um, like a cargo staff, it gave you that flexibility. It allowed you to front load ammunition uh, amongst the, the infantry sections. And then you can attach the, um, the cargo staff pair to the section that is going to be providing fire support or conducting the assault. And therefore, you, you can be much more flexible with how you actually resource um, that ammunition. Uh, or the ammunition for that effect um, better than with the one-shot systems. Um, yeah, we also looked at um, drone, uh, sorry, the uh, lower munitions. So um, we based it on Switchblade 300, but that's not to say that that's the system. We called it Tactical Precision Strike um, for the Phalanx testing. And it really, what it was, was about giving a beyond line of sight strike capability to the platoon, re replacing that 60 millimeter mortar type effect. Um, but giving it a level of precision um, that 60 millimeter more didn't necessarily give with that first round. Um, so that was what that um, what that was about. Uh, hand grenades, uh, we looked at that as well. So offensive and defensive hand grenades, um, and which you know having that having that choice between um, the two different types depending on what your tactical situation is. Uh, and then finally looking at 
um, 40 millimeter grenade rounds as well. So we have one of the best 40 millimeter grenade launchers in the world, but it was looking at, okay, well, what ammunition natures could we give to that to really get the most out of it? Um, so we looked at um, airburst 40 millimeter grenades, um, and they proved really effective uh, in the simulation modeling about being able to, because we were able to test the full breadth of kinetic effects. Um, then that was that was that was really effective at being able to to deliver what we needed in you know at the point of need um, without causing too much collateral damage. Um, but then we also looked at the the one on the top right, so the Raytheon Pike missile as well, giving them that long range precision strike as well. So the the urban phalanx concept was based on not just the structures but the lethality as well. So the two of them were working hand in glove. That does it for the interview. Thanks to Stuart for taking the time to talk with me. Whenever my full video on this concept is published on the main channel, that'll be on screen right now. I'll see you over there.